So, in Guy's understanding, from his knowledge of the multiverse, what are aliens? So he says there are four genres of alien form, and uh, from gross physical to incarnate. So humans, like the aliens, are smaller aspects of a much larger being. As I mentioned in the reply from Guy with the text about the TES, Transistic Cell. So what we have is our universe, a multiverse, which is made up from within our source entity, of which are 12, but the source entity is what we call God. It's what is known as God. And there are 12 other gods, if you like, that have their own multiverses that function in completely different ways, different physics, completely different way of looking at things. And the sources were created by what is called the origin, what the guy has been told to call this uh, creative sentient being, I guess is the correct term, the, the origin, which the Hindus call the absolute. And it is massive. It doesn't know how big it is itself, basically. And it's investigating itself. And in order to investigate itself and understand parts of itself, it has created these source entities. And these source entities have created things within themselves, like our multiverse, and created also within itself beings like us. But from the, in the multiverse, there are also what we call the TES, the true energetic self, which is a much larger being. And then that larger being creates smaller aspects of itself. So the source entities are smaller aspects of the origin, and we're much smaller aspects of the source, which we call God, which is, goes along somewhat with religions, really, in a way, doesn't it? Uh, I think I'm going to explain that in a bit from Guy's explanation and from my book. So, well, so physical aliens. There's four genres of alien. And the first one is gross physical. And we humans are, like the aliens, gross physical aliens, are smaller aspects of a much larger being, which itself is a smaller aspect of an even larger being, which is the source of what religions call God, which I was just saying. So we are aspects of what Guy calls the true energetic self or what is known as our higher self, or the Hindus call the Godhead, or the Laura's canon, canon calls the Oversoul. It is the much bigger part of us that remains disincarnate and retains about 70% of what we are. Why are we incarnating into this low frequency universe and not the higher different parts of the universe? Well, it's because we are helping our higher selves to evolve. And as aspects of our higher selves, we come to this lowest part of the multiverse because we can experience, learn and evolve in an accelerated way through hardship and difficulties. Part of which is because this is of such a low frequency plane of existence that we are almost cut off from our higher selves. It is rather like operating on a 12k modem compared to a billion k or more connection but in the higher frequency realms. So we are operating on a much lower bandwidth of understanding and knowledge. What we see is limited by our own gross physical eyes in a narrow band of the spectrum of light. So yeah, so we're, we're almost cut off from our understanding and knowledge because we're smaller and smaller aspects, less and less percentage of each of the higher beings. So we're less and less able to so we're almost cut off, which is why in science and such like a lot of humans think that you know, are we the only things that are alive? You know, are we the only intelligent beings <laughs> and all that sort of thing? Intelligent. Because we're cut off from knowing our greater selves and the rest of the multiverse through our narrow bandwidth, which we have for understanding. So what is beyond the narrow band of our vision is undetectable. When you think of, I'll put a graphic up about the uh, 
what we see in the spectrum of light. It's a very narrow band of the spectrum that we can actually see with our eyes. So what is beyond the narrow band of our vision is undetectable. It's still there, but we don't see it. Humans tend to think that what we don't see, we tend not to believe in, unless some technology comes along and detects it, such as radio waves all the way along to gamma rays. So then we can see it's there. We know we have a gross physical body because we can see and feel it. The first of the incarnate vehicle alien bodies is in the physical. The human form is created with 10 energy or frequency levels. The first three are the gross physical. The next four are the physico-spiritual or sometimes called the astral. And the next eight to 10 are the spiritual levels. All of those 10 frequencies allow some form of incarnation. Above these levels are in the energetic and are outside the need to incarnate into a physical body. In the spiritual physical levels, it should be noted that often people clarify the fourth as the lower astral. Sometimes it is classified as the astral itself. In Guy's understanding, the fourth is the lower astral, the fifth, the upper lower astral, sixth is a lower upper astral, and the seventh is the upper astral. So the aspects of the higher self that have incarnated into a vehicle in the fourth frequency to experience physical incarnation are in a frequency above us in the third frequency and so are invisible to us. Those incarnated aspects in the fourth frequency can however see us. They are walking around us right now and they are here all the time. Those who incarnated in the fifth frequency can see those in the fourth. And I, I've explained this in the previous video. But let's talk a little bit about some of the frequencies. From the fourth to the seventh frequency, those incarnates start to have control of their bodies. They start not needing gross physical energies and nutrients such as eating and drinking. They start to use energies directly from energy centers called the chakras. There is a marked difference from the fourth compared to the seventh frequencies. If they decided to let us be aware of them, they would start to seem like gods. They could manipulate things and move things with force, but they are still an incarnation. The beings that have incarnated into the 8th to the 10th frequencies are in the higher spiritual realms. When you go from the 6th and 7th levels into the 8th to 10th frequency levels, it is almost as if it is not an incarnation. It is as though the body almost does not exist. Those of us that are able to link into these incarnate beings on these levels will be able to be aware of their presence, but will not be able to see them. So aliens in the 8th to 10th levels are almost not classified as incarnate, but they will still be there. So my prime incarnation is somewhere in those 8th to 11th frequencies. I'm not sure what frequency level he's on, but certainly I have memories of feeling physical although it didn't look like it to me, so somewhere in there. If you think about the thousands of different form factors of life here on Earth, from humans to fish to insects and birds, etc., there is an extremely wide variety of forms. This is just an indication of the myriad of different types of forms that exist throughout the universe. So if you think about the different levels of gravity and living environments found throughout the universe, you get form factors that are designed to be able to live in those different environments. And so there are many variations on what we call the human form. The incarnates in the 10th to 12th frequencies, the spiritual types, are almost totally connected with the rest of themselves to their true energetic self. That big part of themselves that is always disincarnate, always in the energetic and always in the multiversal environment. They know who they are, what they are, and what they have to do in their incarnation, and are able to navigate their way through their incarnation in a karma free way, by not getting addicted to the thoughts, behaviours and actions associated with being in a low frequency environment. I like this one. They maintain themselves in a way that is consistent with their environment. Metaphysical functions they are working with means that telepathy, telekinesis and creativity even are secondary. 
communication with other versions of themselves, body types, and individuals across different galaxies are not a problem for them. They know who and what they are. They know they are in an incarnate state for a certain period of time and when they are leaving. The body form would be amorphous, it would be much lighter, and they would only be tactile within the frequency level that it is incarnate into. Which my experience of my higher being, my primary incarnate self. The higher the frequency, the finer they are. The fourth type are completely energetic. They are aspects of sentient energy projected by our true energetic selves or higher self into a smaller unit of sentient energy just to experience different parts of the multiverse sometimes even here we definitely cannot see these but sometimes if they come down low enough in frequency we can see them as an amorphous mass and we can before we incarnate come down to these lower frequency levels to see what we are going to get into before we incarnate here they definitely have no form factor but if they come down to this level we can catch them on some cameras and they look like balls of energy or orbs if you like these beings are totally connected and everything they can do in the energetic is done by pure intention and pure thought instantaneous connectivity with the tes or higher self and source god and instantaneous connectivity with the universe they can do anything they need to they can create planets or star systems if they wanted to and they are very highly evolved. So basically there's four uh, body types. One, the gross physical. The first three frequencies are associated with the physical universe. That's where we are. The spiritual physical. The next four frequencies, the fourth to the seventh. The spiritual from the eighth to the twelfth. And the fourth is the purely energetic, which go above the twelfth frequency and therefore go to the next four dimension. I'm wondering how much more of this to read. There's more, much more information. There are the three genre of alien vehicles. They exist in the first three gross physical frequencies, which will make, these are the mechanical ones. Uh, use advanced technology to manipulate space, gravitational, attractivity, electromagnetism. So there's more about different alien vehicles of the beings that live in the different frequencies. We're going to have to get the book to read about them. I don't see that. I'm not going to, I'm just talking about my own personal understanding about myself and where, and where I am. And hopefully other people might see. So where do the aliens come from? The general understanding from our perspective about UFOs is that they are mechanical. They come from the first three frequencies that are available for the multiverse and the first three frequencies of our universe. They're both physical. Sorry about the squeaky chair. They move around sometimes with higher technology, but they are basically within the visible range that we see with our telescopes. Sometimes we call them Arcturians, Syrians, or Palladians. Sometimes those incarnate civilizations are in a slightly higher frequency of the fourth or fifth frequencies. In general, those who are interacting with or abducted by are those within our universal environment. They can be from the stars close to us or from other galaxies as well. The spiritual physical alien, incarnate alien, is from a different, similar location. So it's in a higher frequency. It's in a higher frequency level. So that would be other planets, galaxies, or nebulae. Or rather, they are there, but in the fourth to seventh frequency levels of the physical universe. So we don't see them. But they're still there in increasing levels of frequency and therefore decreasing levels of physicality. They are here now on Earth observing us, seeing what we are doing with our free will. Because a lot of these individuals in the gross physical don't have free will. They don't have individualised free will. They have various different forms of collective will, which is interesting, right? Sometimes these individuals are tied into a collective will. Or sometimes in extreme cases, it's a hive mentality. A hive mentality will where they are working together towards a common goal. And you might hear about some of this when you uh, listen to people that are channeling uh, entities or higher beings there are people that are doing that and they often talk about a collective or a hive mind etc but in general these are areas of the physical universe that we don't see because they are in a higher frequency there will become a time when we will see them as we develop a thought process that takes us beyond the gross physicality 
and we will have machines that can see them. All people who have become self-aware and self-awake will see them as an overlay on the physical with their own eyes. As an overlay. So it's like you're seeing something that feels like it's not there, but it is. Because you might see something that's working on a different frequency level. So the spiritual incarnates. Spiritual incarnates again come from galaxies, nebulae, planets, and are of the 8th to 12th frequency levels, and are still in the physical universe. The purely energetic visitors here don't exist in the physical, they exist in any of those universes represented by any of those frequencies that are in the sub-dimensions of the four dimensions anywhere in the multiverse generally. Although it has to be said that they do in general, as a generalisation, tend to oversee individuals if they're from the third to fifth dimension. So they go into different types of abductions for different reasons. But I'm going to skip that. You have to get the book to read that. I'll look at guys' work. But I'm going to talk a bit about what are we humans and how we incarnate. So he says, I think a lot of us think that we are energy beings, but we are not the human body or energy beings. So we're not a human body or energy beings. So we may then be a bit confused about what we are. I've certainly been confused about what I am. <laughs> so to Guy's current level of understanding, which is transient, because as we move deeper into the knowledge base, we move on with our understanding and we're allowed to see more. So I think I might have mentioned that in previous videos. I only say what I understand now, but as I move on and more experiences and more understanding comes to me, I'll change my perspective and ideas because as I'm allowed to see more of how things truly are. But it is our beingness that defines who and what we are. And this beingness is our true energetic self. Which Guy says is not an exact representation of who we actually are, as the word energetic is a bit of a red herring. But he was told to use it at the beginning to help people to understand by these much higher beings, like the source. The true energetic self is the same as the oversoul, Godhead, or higher self, which we've said before. And if it's all these things, what is the true energetic self? It is, and we are, pure sentience. Consciousness, self-awareness and conscious creativity, etc. That are functions of what we are. Consciousness, for example, is a part of the road that energy will go through in order to reach pure sentience. But more than that, we are sentience that is given a body of energy. A body of energy is a vehicle that we use to house the sentience. It is how we move around in the environment that we use to evolve through. That part of the source which is being used for us to help it evolve through. So we're helping the source to evolve. And the source is helping the origin to evolve and understand. Right? We're all doing the same thing on all the levels. We all have one goal. We can move that sentience from one group or body to another. When we understand who and what we are, and how we can work with those energies. We can move around. So the body of energy that we were given by our creator, the source, when we evolve to a point of understanding of what we are, we can move that sentience away from that original body of energies, or sphere of energy, if you like, to anywhere around the source, and anywhere around the multiversal environment that it's given us to work with. And we can therefore relocate our sentience. And we do so. And actually even our source entity will do so as well. As our source entity or God is a creation of what is called the origin. Which the Hindus call the absolute. So we are pure sentience. Pure sentience understands what it creates. Perfects that creation and reproduces it. And it keeps going and sees where it can use its level of creativity to advance its own evolutionary progression. Progression is above evolution. Evolution is just one part of what we do as we progress. One of the ways in which we use our sentience is to experience different environments, which our true energetic self desires to accelerate its own evolutionary progress. And it does this by incarnating 
by experiencing the lower frequencies of the multiversal environment in a most profoundly integrated and immersed way, to experience things it would never no do normally. But there is a structure behind that. We have a hierarchical structure. This structure is sort of static, but it will work with parallel conditions. We don't exist in one reality. We have multiple realities in which we can exist within. One of the ways we do this is in a, in a static function, is to project parts of us, not human beings, but parts of our true energetic self. So we project parts out that become souls, or they become sub-souls. You may notice that the number 12 is increasingly seen in spiritual work, and you'll see it here too. The reason behind it is because the number 12 proliferates itself in the structure of the origin, which is copied down into the structure of the source and into ourselves. So what we can do in terms of our reproductibility or our diversification of self is based upon 12. So we can in our higher self sense, in our true energetic self sense project. So think of yourself as a true energetic self now. That can project a maximum of 12 aspects. So the true energetic self, I'll put some pictures up. The true energetic self can project 12 aspects from itself. That is in our higher self sense, not in our soul sense, as that is something that we as human beings use to associate ourselves with our spirit. And that is a bit limited in terms of what we really are. So think of yourself as your higher self right now. Put yourself and your mind in your higher self's position. So you are not aspects or souls incarnate in a human body. You are now your higher self. This much larger aspect of the individualized unit of sentience of the source. So there are 12 aspects that could be projected down from this true energetic self out into very different multiversal environments or universal environments to experience different things in a parallel but linear condition. The parallelisms occur when we have the opportunity to create a choice, a dualistic, trialistic, quadrilistic choice, where we have the possibility of possibilities or the possibility of possible possibilities to create other environments through having a chance of going either this way or that, meeting this person here or conversely that person there, and the different fractionalization that can happen from that. So that would be more of your parallels, parallel universes or parallel event space. Now, in general, there's a percentage of sentience that remains in the energetic. 70% remains in the energetic. So if ourselves, as true energetic selves, the TES, projects all of our 12 aspects that we could project into the physical or other parts of the multiversal environment were in fact projected, then 70% of us would remain in the energetic. The other 30% would be spread out between those 12 aspects or souls, which would mean that there is only about 2.5% of our sentience per soul. So yeah, this is getting diminished. So these 12 aspects, one of these 12 aspects from the TS is my primary incarnation. And it has 2.5% of the sentience of the TES. If, there are, if the TES has made 12 aspects. As souls or aspects, we are particularly powerful. We are massive creators. So we can ourselves project 12 smaller versions of ourselves. 12 subsouls or shards. Again, again out into the physical or multiversal environment. But as with the true energetic self, we must retain 70% of our own sentience. So if we projected down 12 shards of our aspect or soul, then each of those shards would have 2.5% of the 2.5% of the sentience of the TES, right? So it's 2.5% of 2.5%. So in effect, if everything is projected out, projected out in a linear fashion, there can be 144 projections from our higher self, or TES. All of these things are concurrently understood. The memories, actions, emotions, behaviour, beingness, words, thoughts and experiences are all concurrently absorbed by us as the true energetic self. So all of those, my primary incarnation and me as a secondary, and some primary incarnations, when a primary incarnation has a secondary incarnation, it just means he hasn't made 12 shards. He's just having one, which is me. But other 
primary incarnations may have 12 shards. And everything that all of those beings are experiencing, etc., are absorbed by the TES. He has all of that experience of all of those 144 beings, a possible 144 beings. Anyway, so hopefully some of these pictures will give you an idea. How am I going to talk about how we incarnate? One of them is the, the secondary incarnation, primary and secondary incarnations. I'll talk about that because that's what's relevant to me. But here he talks about sympathetic souls, twin flames, soulmates, all that sort of thing. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just talking about me here, selfishly. If you want to know about the other things, you can read the book and do some investigation. Secondary incarnation. Now things start to get interesting for the secondary incarnation. We can have something that is a primary incarnation that can have a secondary incarnation. Moi. So we can incarnate and then have an incarnation within an incarnation. This is what he explained in his excerpt from his other book to me. This incarnation is not a parallel incarnation, it's a linear incarnation. But there still is a possibility of different realities that are created through the different choices we make. Dualities, trialities, quadrualities. The possibility of possibilities and the possibility of those possibilities being possible. And the fractalized parallel environments that we create. But this is fairly static. This is when an entity or aspect decides to incarnate in a higher frequency vehicle, a higher frequency body, a body that is still incarnate as a vehicle, but is at a higher frequency within the structure of the physical universe, in a frequency so high that we would consider it energetic. We experience it a lot sometimes as we see craft come and go, as we see individuals appear in, in from in front of our faces and then disappear. But the aspect or soul that incarnates in a vehicle, a body that is higher then where we are now is able to have the functionality associated with that frequency. And so above a certain level, a soul or aspect is fully aware, fully capable of everything that it can do when it is in the disincarnate state whilst being incarnate. As a result of that, it can decide to leave that body, to leave it behind, to leave it in stasis, and then move out into a different form to enjoy an incarnation that may take several years from our perspective and then feed back that information to its primary incarnate state. Sometimes that body is still maintained and sometimes that body is still active and the soul travels backwards and forwards between the primary and secondary incarnate vehicle. That can cause some confusion sometimes because sometimes the memories leak between the two. As I was saying earlier, I have leaky memories. What memories leaked from my primary? There are some interesting phenomena with this because it can cause disorientation, I'll say. And in my case, I had memories of being a different person, different place, with blonde hair, which I explained earlier. I'm not going to get into sub-incarnations, all the rest. How it affects us psychologically. So you get twin say, twin flames, sympathetic souls, sub-incarnations. There's only, uh, I'm only going to read out the secondary incarnation how it relates to me because that's what I understand I don't have the experience of all these other ones but you might and you might be interested in that so if you are get my book and listen to Guy and look at his videos and such secondary incarnations these have left their primary soul in a different location they have feelings of not really belonging here 100% they are mostly loners 100% sometimes suffer severe depression and have difficulty in fitting in no I was a bit depressed at some point, but I got over that years ago. So I had a little bit at one time, but not not sometimes. I'm perfectly on the level now. I think the more I understood about everything, the more stable I feel, actually. Having understood what everything means and why I am like I am. Sometimes I suffer severe depression and have difficulty in fitting in. And yeah, I don't generally fit in, you might imagine. <laughs> they can have a lot of feelings of coming from different planets or galaxies. I think I figured out with the leaky dreams of having long blonde hair and with other people, I always thought, which is right really, that it was a previous life that maybe I was an ET living in a different planet in the life before this one. And that in fact is right, but not in the way that it actually is. I thought I would only have one body. I had one body somewhere else. And now I've got this body. 
and who knows where I go next. But that's not the case. And they also can experience feelings of confusion. <sighs> yes. Not knowing why they are here and cannot see the point of being here. Absolutely. I went through that a lot. Can't see the point of anything. At the point of this mundane planet, the social system we have, the work till you drop. You work all your life and then you retire for a few years and drop dead. It doesn't make any sense. Never made any sense to me. It had to be more than that. It just didn't seem to make any difference. I never, I ne never fitted me. I never fitted in with the work idea and scheme or with education. The way they educate people is so bad. I always felt that. Obviously, I re I just rebelled against it. The whole thing. Some of them frequently reported being abducted. Yeah. Because their primary incarnation is at a level where the primary incarnate vehicle travels around the galaxy of the universe, or the universe. And that aspect decides to have a low incarnate physical experience. And also that all of its colleagues will benefit from that experience. Then once in a while, the colleagues will take the body away to monitor it. We've already said this. See how it's coping in the frequency environment with a higher frequency aspect soul. Identifying if they can maintain its longevity for long enough and make sure that the secondary incarnation is efficient and is being used to its optimal condition. I'm not sure I'm working at optimal condition, to be honest. So it will be quite regular for <laughs> medical examinations to happen with these people who are experiencing secondary incarnations. Specifically, if they're providing lots of information and data about their environment back to where the primary incarnation is residing. Data, that's what I think. I do feel that I, I'm a data gatherer. I mean, it's not just watching YouTube and stuff like that, which I do. And it's looking at people and reading how people are looking at society. You know, I think I get more. I think I'm gaining more data about the environment and everything, how it is, because that's one of the purposes. But I don't realise I'm doing it. It's just all been taken in, all been taken in. Did a lot of travelling at one point, trying to understand everything. But that was data gathering as well, everything's data gathering, I think. Basically, I go into continuing experiences and understanding in my book, and uh, I had a message. I was told, one of my experiences, that, that I have a wife. My primary incarnation has a family. So although they're less physical than us, they still have a, in their environmental frequency they have what they feel is what looks like is, is to us a physical reality they have a reality a level of physical reality that doesn't look physical to us but it is to them and there i have a wife and a child and i was told what her name was and i've been showing and i know what she looks like i've had then memories normally when i'm asleep i have some memories dream memories of meeting her uh, you know of times when i've been together with her I might talk about that in another video, it's a separate thing, I think. But uh, one of the things I did in 2021, I decided to try and draw my primary incarnation. So I set pencil to paper. But as I was doing it, I started to draw him with a blue pencil. He was, I was drawing him as a blue being. I was trying to remember his face and draw, get it all down. And that was like, um, it's like automatic writing, you know, where people write automatic writing in different languages or unknown languages, you know, etc. It is, it's like that, but I was drawing. I didn't realise I was drawing blue. I was drawing it in blue. I realised that he was blue. He looks like a blue being. He's a blue coloured skin. And so he's blue. So I'll put that picture up. That was another revelation. So I've had confirmation in that I've had a lot more memories of stuff that I've done in incidences. I think there has to be another video some memories and things like that. Just that I've had a family and I've had, I know what her name is, and I know I've got a daughter, and I've started drawing myself in blue, and I recognise that my partner from my primary incarnation has been in my dreams ever since I was a child, because now when I look back, it was always the same person. She always looked uh, a human, not with a blue skin, etc., because that wouldn't have made any sense to me, but... It's how she's appeared to me, but it's always her. It's very interesting. And I have drawn her as well in her 
how she looked at me in the dreams and also what she actually looks like, what I think she actually looks like. That may all come in another video, but it's all in the book. Buy it now. <laughs> Links in the description. So I think that'll do for me on discovering who I am. And things are still being unraveled. I'm still learning things, getting more memories. It came heavily for a while, but it slowed up a bit at the moment. So yeah, and apparently one of the things I'm supposed to do is get the word out. Um, and that's what Guy was saying. He's, he's in, in contact with his higher sentient beings. I said, yeah, okay, I'm going to write a book. And because I'd already written one book about my experiences with UFOs and paranormal stuff. And then I said, I'm going to, okay, because Guy said, I was going to make some videos a bit like this. And Guy said, all right, maybe you might want to write a book. I said, yeah, I don't know, I don't want to write a book. I didn't know if I wanted to write another book. But it turns out I did. Yeah, and then he said, that's good. He said, because now you're fulfilling one of your life, your life purpose, or one of your life purposes is to write a book. It's to get, it's to tell everyone this, to get it out there. Not many people may be seeing this or reading the book, but the point is whoever it does reach, it's supposed to reach. And that's the point of it. And it's out there as a record. So that's why I'm doing this. Part of what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, so, so uh, thanks for watching this video. Thanks for listening. And uh, if you want to support me, please I buy a copy of the book. It's in ebook or physical book or audio book. Thanks very much. I'll see you in the next video.